the absolute truth cannot be realized through the domain of the mind, but only through the heart. And being lost in emotions blocks the heart, whether it's gross emotions, whether it's subtle emotions, so that we need to begin to be able to see emotions as just awakened energy. Welcome to Dale Borglum's Healing at the Edge. We are very happy to share with you Dale's profound insight and open heart. Please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Dale to support this podcast. Welcome, everybody. What I would like to talk about today with all of you dear people is transmuting emotions into presence. I am on these email lists where I get these Buddhist articles by Buddhist meditation teachers. Uh, and I got an article this last week by Sokni Rinpoche, who's a wonderful Tibetan Lama. He was really my last meditation teacher before I tumbled into fatherhood. And <laughs> 21 years ago. My son turned 21 this last week, believe it or not. Anyway, I was doing all these long retreats with Sokni, and he he sent out this article that I found really, what can I say, super interesting, but more than that, it really brought some things into focus for me. And what he said was that when he first started teaching here in the West, like 25 years ago, he was very excited because Western students were so smart they were so committed to the Dharma. They were meditating a lot. They were coming to retreats in the way that Tibetans didn't want to do. He thought, this is going to be great. These people are going to make all this progress. And then after about 10 years or so, he started noticing that that wasn't happening so much. <laughs> that all these really smart people were kind of stuck. When he started looking at it a little more carefully, he came to the conclusion that the channel of communication between the mind and the feeling emotional level was really not open in a lot of Western people. We've had certain kinds of early childhood experiences that Tibetan people don't usually have. So that even though they understood the Dharma and even though they practiced the Dharma and even though they were smart and even though they were committed, after a certain point, there was some lack of being with one's feelings in a way that kept short-circuiting or at least very much slowing down the contemplative process. I started playing with this on my own. Sometime last week, I was lying in bed and I couldn't get to sleep. There was not something that was really worrying me. My life is in pretty good shape. Love, money, work family, home, there's really nothing I can complain about. But I was lying in bed and there was this just sort of agitated energy that wouldn't let me go to sleep. It, it was not about something special, something in particular. So I, I started applying this notion that Sokni had pointed out of really using a tantric approach, which we will get into in about 10 minutes, a tantric approach to working with emotions in a way of really communicating, really getting the message, really not just being aware, not just opening your heart to it, but forming a relationship in a certain kind of way. And I started doing this with this feeling of agitation. I just laid there. I'm a much better meditator when I'm lying down under the covers. when <laughs> I'm sitting up straight for some reason. I don't know why that is. But anyway, there I was. And I started feeling all this energy in my body that was not, it was not like painful, but it was just slightly disturbed energy. And I just started paying attention to that. What does it feel like? What's the emotional quality? What's the message here? Opening up to it, opening up to it. And it, it began to get more and more spacious and open. And then it opened up into a place where there was barely anything happening. And I would notice I thoughts would arise and I saw how empty they were that I was thinking, Oh, this is interesting or, Oh, wow. Or whatever. 
And I could see very clearly that even those, even those thoughts of me looking at what was going on were just empty thoughts. And then that stopped and there was nothing. There was nothing at all. And I couldn't even think because there's nobody there. Now, the Buddha said, it is a rare person who isn't startled or terrified by the Heart Sutra. Okay. Now, the Heart Sutra is the one that starts out, form is emptiness and emptiness is form. Right? That it's all empty, but at the same time, all emptiness is form. And I was hanging out in a place where it's all empty. Right? And it was the first time that I felt some fear meditating in about 50 years. <laughs> it's like, whoa. And I think that's a good thing that it like shook my sense of self at its roots. Something shifted in me that day. Something shifted in a way that I find a greater sense of ease, a greater sense of Life is a little more of a dream, but it's a kind of a pleasant dream than it was a couple of weeks ago, maybe. So what I would like to do today is, is talk about this tantric practice, both with this very subtle fear of death thing that everybody has, but even with much more obvious, grosser emotions, right? I mean, suppose that you felt underappreciated as a child. You might overreact as an adult to somebody criticizing or blaming you. I mean, I have a student in one of my groups. She's been in this group for, let's think, 14 years now. And she was in an incubator for the first month of her life. So she's been very sensitive to not being appreciated, right? Because in the first 14 years, of, if, I'm sorry, the first month of her life, she didn't have anybody hold her hardly at all. And if I paid more attention to somebody else in the group that, than her, she would take it personally. And it's been only this very, very slow process of working with that sense of uh, shame that I'm not worth being held. The absolute truth cannot be realized through the domain of the mind, but only through the heart. And being lost in emotions blocks the heart whether it's gross emotions, whether it's subtle emotions, so that we need to begin to be able to see emotions as just awakened energy. But for Westerners, emotions are so sticky. Emotions are really, in my experience, both as a meditator and as a meditation teacher, the main obstacle for almost everybody, whether it's a, a big, deep emotion or whether it's even that just subtle distraction that need to not be empty that's going on all the time. Emptiness offends the ego, right? <laughs> ego is the mother of all forms. Ego creates form. So if we go back to Buddha's Heart Sutra, and we're not going to dive into that too deeply because that's a whole talk or maybe 10 talks in itself. But the Heart Sutra, emptiness is form and form is emptiness. Can we see form as emptiness? Can we right now hear my voice, feel your body sitting on whatever you're sitting on, be with the thoughts and emotions that are rising, and not get lost in the solidity that there's a me experiencing this stuff, but it's just happening. It's just awakened energy unfolding. And some of the times we can do that, but there's this primary contraction that we believe that everything is solid, independent, and permanent. And we don't see that we don't see because there's no contrast, because we're always there, right? You don't see light without the contrast of dark or vice versa. And it's very seldom that we see how lost we are in this emotional reactivity to life because we're always there, even when we're deeply into meditation, there's usually this subtle sense of I'm meditating, I'm doing kind of well, or even that getting even beyond that to that fear of death that I was experiencing when I was lying in bed last week. Okay, my, my teacher Sokni Rinpoche in this article that he sent out, he talked about what he called beautiful monsters. And he said that it's really important to look at emotions as both the beautiful part and the monster part, 
Like if you have a difficult emotion, let's suppose you're angry or let's suppose you're afraid. On one hand, there is beauty because the emotion itself is just pure energy. And even beyond that, when we do the healing work we're about to embark on here, well, it'll be revealed that even the anger, even the fear has this beautiful side to it. But at the same time, it is a monster. It is something that's been, how can we say this? It's been something that keeps us from resting in our true nature moment to moment to moment. There's some unhealthy distortion, both in a subtle or gross sense, in our mind and in our feelings, that we begin to believe the relative truth, that we're we're not able to surrender into the absolute truth. And these beautiful monsters become the lenses, our attachment to our anger, our attachment to our fear, through which we see all of our experience. We're going to investigate how we can heal this this pattern, how we can best allow awareness and compassion to deeply touch these emotions. What Sokni discovered and what my experience has been is that just doing the usual practice, so I'm going to be aware of my feelings. I'm going to bring mindfulness to what it is that's being experienced. So a quantum mindfulness of the experience is is mindfulness, a quantum experience of the experiencer is self-compassion. Can we have this equanimity for ourselves for what it is that's going on? And that isn't really always a very easy thing to do. There's a process here that we're going to be talking about. The first thing is, can we drop our awareness from thinking into really feeling what's going on? What's going on in your body like right now? Open awareness to the moods, the feelings, the emotions. Without any goal, you're not trying to fix things. Just meet whatever feelings are there right now. You're not trying to find anything special, anything pleasant or anything unpleasant. Everything's always changing. Just allowing thoughts to come and go to try to stay with the feelings and emotions. Eventually, we can begin to include the thoughts. But initially, just be with feelings, emotions, sensations. Just being aware of them with as little judgment, as little grasping as you possibly can. And you'll notice that it's difficult to do that. You keep turning away. You keep distracting, hiding. See if you can keep turning toward it, touching what you're feeling, listening to what you're experiencing. Being with the the raw direct, naked energy itself. Can you even begin to be with the experiencer rather than the experience? Just what does it feel like to be you as these feelings keep changing, 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 being deeply present with your feelings and emotions without any resistance at all? Trusting the wisdom of the emotions. This is a really big step to trust that what you're feeling is awakened energy. It doesn't have to be changed. It doesn't have to be fixed. You don't even have to understand it. You're just being with this changing flow of feeling. Without any resistance, without any judgment. And then the hard part is to wait, to not expect something's going to change right away, to not rush into feeling that you've got to fix something. There's nothing to accomplish. You're making friends with who you are. Let it take as much time as you want it to take. And what we're talking about now can be something that's done as a formal meditation practice. It can also just be an attitude that you bring into daily life. 
You can stay as long as you want with what's being experienced. You're friends with what's happening. So whether you have this relationship or that relationship, it's just being there, being there with the feelings, without resistance, with acceptance, without trying to fix or learn. And as you do this, they may eventually start to open up. They might want to communicate with you, tell you what they're trying to tell you. They want to be free. They want to maybe ask you a question about what you're experiencing. And maybe these raw feelings aren't as scary as they once seemed to be as we approach them with this attitude of non-resistance, of wanting to make friends. So it's not just awareness, it's not just compassion. It's really an attitude of curiosity, of warmth, of wanting to meet parts of yourself that have been avoided again and again and again. All sorts of communication can happen in both directions. You're talking to the emotions, maybe not verbally, they're talking to you. So that in a way, what we're doing here is giving up our identity. Tantric Buddhism is about letting go of your identity. As we go through the yanas of Buddhism, Hinayana, we're willing to let things be just the way they are in Vipassana meditation. Mahayana is we give up practicing for ourselves. But now we're getting to the point of giving up your identity, my identity, that I am a solid person experiencing a solid reality and just really allowing this feeling relationship with experience to be something that is guiding us to deepening surrender moment to moment to moment. So there's no fear of pain. There's no fear of intense emotion. There's no fear of subtle emotion. We're allowing emotion to be our guiding principle, our friend, if you will. And focusing on our inherent wholeness, our Buddha nature, rather than what it is that we've been trying to fix. Feelings of unworthiness, feelings of abandonment, feelings of loneliness, gross, subtle, will continue to arise. None of us have had a perfect childhood. None of us have had a perfect last year. And to the extent that we can begin now to have this other kind of relationship with feelings, to me, it, it brings such a sense of ease where I'm not trying to fix things in the same way. I'm not feeling, how can I say this? That it has been those emotions, the gross and the subtle emotions that are keeping things from settling down, settling down enough to see the nature of things, the empty nature the open nature, the connected nature of reality, right? That being lost in this emotional level, even though you practice enough that the emotions are not out of hand anymore, you're not freaking out the way you did 20 years ago, but there's still this being lost in emotion and distracting, distracting, distracting. Why is the mind distracted all the time? Because it doesn't, the ego doesn't want to feel the surrender into emptiness so that there is big emotions, there's subtle emotions that keep us going all the time. We can try to be aware of them. We can try to have compassion for ourselves because, so oh, let's do Tong Len because I'm suffering. My friends are suffering. I'd been trying that for a whole bunch of decades and it didn't really get to this, this place of this ease of being with emotions as awakened energy and having this friendly back and forth. Sokti Rinpoche called it having a, a handshake relationship. You're not embracing it, but you're shaking hands. You're getting to know, you're getting to know the emotion. 
And I think it's a really wise metaphor that we're meeting the emotion in, at that level. We liberate emotions by seeing their empty nature. Good morning, everybody. My name is Susie. And um, I uh, have always, you know, pride, kind of prided myself on health, you know, and uh, not overdoing it, particularly in any way, shape or form, but uh, just my good health. And then suddenly I was besought with illness. And currently I deal with a lot of pain and um, it's very difficult for me to let go of that pain or see that pain pain as my friend because my whole life has changed and um i wonder what you can say about that i i know of ram das's fierce grace but he did kind of transition to loving his pain and i just don't understand how that can happen what you what you said and uh in the very beginning, you said something that seemed to imply to me that you were hoping things were going to change. That, yes. that that if you made friends with your emotions, they'd be fixed. Right. right. And to the extent that there is that hope, to the extent that there is that motivation behind the practice, you're setting up a battle between you there's some kind of internal civil war going on and the point i've been trying to make here today and I, I guess i didn't make it quite clearly enough is that it's allowing them to be exactly the way they are yeah rather than try to fix them and to the extent that you can be with them you'll see that it's empty and empty is a scary word because it sounds like it sounds like there's nothing there. Uh, and another word could be spacious or another word could be even full. But the point is that when you have the opinion that I have this solid emotion that's a problem, and if I pay attention to it and I love it, maybe it's going to go away, then you're setting up this push-pull, this resistance with who you're having the relationship with, what you're having the relationship with. Is it possible to just be with the feelings with no agenda at all other than befriending them? No resistance, no grasping, no trying to understand something. So like when I was lying in bed that night and I was feeling that agitation, what I would do in the past was I would take some herbal sleep remedy or I'd start saying my mantra until I knocked my brain out or something. And I, so instead, what I was doing was, okay, there's this agitated energy in my body. Let's just be with it. Even if I don't go to sleep for a bunch of hours, can I be with what this feels like? And as I was just able to be there with no resistance, it gradually, over the course of a maybe 20 or 30 minutes, began to dissolve into the spaciousness. Now, I'm not saying it's going to dissolve for you. And I wasn't trying to dissolve anything. I was just saying, okay. Here's what it is. Mm -hmm. And that's why what I'm saying today is in a way kind of a step beyond what we've been saying before about working with emotions. Because usually we were getting more and more subtle in how can we fix these things by a more clear awareness, a deeper compassion, right? In Hinayana Theravada practice, when there's a difficult emotion, you become aware of it. And you gradually replace it with a wholesome quality, right? You replace hatred with loving kindness, for instance. And then in, in Mahayana practice, when you experience a difficult emotion, you have compassion for it, and it's gradually transformed through compassion. Here, what we're talking about is being with it exactly the way that it is. We don't have to fix it. We can just befriend it. We can shake hands with it. We can open to it. We can trust that fundamentally it's whole, that it doesn't separate us from our wholeness. Yeah. And, and that it actually is the perfect gateway or portal into the surrender into who we are. So that your emotions are 
your gateway. My emotions are my gateway. I have a different background than you do, obviously. We each have patterns that arise again and again and again. And we've developed ways of smoothing it out a little bit, but are often caught in seeing this whole pattern as solid. I'm solid. The emotions are solid. I'm working with my solid emotions. And what we're saying here is allowing them to be exactly as they are, which is changing and empty, spacious. Thank you. You're very welcome, Susie. I, I don't know if that, I've been meditating for five decades and it still is, is there are emotions that catch me. So I'm not saying that immediately everybody dissolves into happiness here. Yeah. But, but to me, one of the main points here is that I think for most of us, our relationship with our emotions is what keeps us stuck. Thank you, uh, Ramdev. And um, it's hard for me to think of a, a better talk that you uh, that you gave just now in terms of um, what is going to what is very helpful to me in the moment. My question to you in in the theme and spirit of the talk that you just gave is to ask you to go just a little bit deeper on it on a very helpful answer you provided many Saturdays ago. I spoke about my father, Don, who I think is has the same name as your father going through end of life. He is now in hospice, probably has just a few weeks remaining of life due to pancreatic cancer. And I am experiencing a panoply of emotions, um, most of them very strong, most of them uh, grief is disguising as usually coming as frustration, anger, usually at the people around me, particularly my family of origin, that I will not bore you or everybody, but let's just say there's it, maybe the loss of a, a family member brings out the best in some families of origin. I would say that is not the case with my family of origin, and it usually brings out, I, I won't say the worst, but it brings out the most tension, the most controlling, and my family of origin is a, is a collection of very strong-willed personalities, all trying to assert themselves and grief uh turns on the the switch to volatility my question is this especially going into now this hospice and final stage is you had given me the suggestion very helpfully about adopting some grounding practices when i'm in these moments that that is beneficial to get through i do regularly meditate typically along the lines of TM, because that's what I first learned many years ago. So that's sort of my go-to. And my question to you is, could you perhaps go one layer more detailed in terms of grounding practices that you would recommend in the moment? Because I, when things, as you know, probably better than anybody, when somebody is dying, uh, tempers flare, things are done in the moment, the idea of excusing myself to go meditate for 20 minutes, and by the way, would everybody please be quiet, is a, a hilarious non-option. And I would love for for maybe an example or two of some grounding practices that might be helpful to me in the moment and give me an alternative to responding emotionally, typically with trying to out-anger the anger, <laughs> which I know is not helpful to me and anybody else. Okay, I don't quite understand out angering anger, but but I do understand the rest of your question. <laughs> I just meant not not responding in a way that is heightening the volatility, but rather responding okay. in a way that lessens the volatility and emotion is my preferred approach, and that's difficult to do. Okay, well, I don't remember what I said a bunch of weeks ago, and I would say that there is something a deeper thing we can do with grief than just be grounded. Grief, as you suggested, are the negative, or at least diff let's not use the word negative, are the difficult emotions that arise in response to feeling separate. Anger, frustration, sadness. It's not just sad. It's all the feelings that arise when we're caught in feeling separate. Somebody's dying. Somebody has died. Somebody's leaving. One's lost an identity, whatever it might be. As I was suggesting right before your question, I was talking to Susie. There are these stages of practice of getting to the place where one can do this deeper tantric relationship with emotions. And if it's something as strong as the death of the imminent death of your father in a difficult family situation, 
the probably this more subtle thing that I was talking about here will require some preparatory stages that we should talk about right now. I am a, a very firm proponent of embodied mindfulness. In the West, a lot of people, and it's kind of the same thing we've been talking about all day, that, that people get caught in emotions. Emotions are energy moving in the body. Emotion, moving energy. The first thing we have to do is to be able to feel what's going on, to be mindful of what you're experiencing, being having an equanimous mindfulness of the experience. So in, in doing that, for people in the West, because of early childhood stuff, a lot of people aren't very grounded and centered. Grounding is the very first stage of being embodied. It's being learned from maybe the second trimester in utero till about two years old. And it's about learning to be dependent and trusting that you're supported. Okay, it's the antidote to fear. I see. But at the same time, being grounded, since it's the earliest stage, dealing with fear and fear of death, is it's about being dependent, trusting the support of earth, earth mother, earth element, mother, mother. And it's not about doing something. Then the next stage of being centered, two years old to about four years old, I'm sorry, 18 months old till about four years old, there's some overlap there, is about being centered, antidote to guilt and shame, and about moving into the world. So being in this very active situation with difficult family dynamics unfolding, being grounded might be something you'd have to go off into the back room to do. And being centered is much more the martial art of being with his family. That's the second and third chakra. So that right now, Nobody has to close their eyes, but we'll we'll do this together because these practices aren't about meditating. They're being present in your life. The first thing is, can you be grounded? There is this grounding breath that I talk about, the egg laying breath. You imagine you're laying an egg as you breathe out. So as you breathe out, just slightly emphasize your exhalation and imagine you're pushing energy out through the base of your torso, out through your perineum into the earth that supports and nourishes. And as you breathe in, a natural, relaxed in-breath, receiving that energy. Breathing out, slightly emphasizing the out-breath, pushing down into the earth, letting this energy come into you. You're inhabiting your feet, your legs, your pelvic floor. We're not going to do this for a really long time, but there is hopefully some increasing sense of stability, of trust that is, as my friend Ramdas says, it's safe to be here now. Okay, so it's not just being here now, it's being here now and feeling supported, feeling it's okay to be here now. It's safe. I'm being taken care of. I can thrive. I can start to relax a bit. Grounding is about being physical. It's, it's safe to be physical. But now the next stage of development, and stay grounded as I'm saying this, if you can, the next stage of development is about moving into the world, doing something. Not only is it safe to be here, but I can, be, I can go into the world, move around, manipulate objects, interact with people, etc. And that's being centered, and that's inhabiting the lower belly. The Japanese call it the hara, H-A-R-A, which literally means the sea of chi. The Chinese call it the Dan Tien, the Sufis call it the Kath. And it's the place from which martial arts are done. It's much more appropriate to be grounded and centered than to just be grounded if you're in an interactive situation. And being centered, imagine now that instead of breathing down through the base, you're just breathing down to the lower belly, a place a few fingers below your navel, a few fingers width inside the front of your body, two, three inches down, two or three inches in. And imagine that you have a huge blood pressure cuff around your lower belly, where your belt would be if you have on a regular pair of pants. And that as you're breathing out and you're breathing in, there's a constant pressure on that belt. Usually when we breathe out, the lower belly would collapse. It expands as we're breathing in. 
because air fills the lungs, lungs push down the diaphragm, diaphragm pushes out on the intestines and the lower belly comes out. What I'm asking you though is to maintain some sense of relaxation and strength as you're breathing out. So it's not like in place of being grounded, we're assuming you're a little grounded right now. And as you breathe out, can you drop down into the lower belly with each out breath and feel that sense of being centered, feel the sense that there is this Shakti, this chi that's flowing through you that's doing the action. It's not your energy, it's the energy. It's the energy that allows you to interact wisely with your family members. In some traditions, they really very come out, come out and directly say that the belly supports the open heart. And I think it's fairly intuitively clear that if there's not a centered, integrated structure there, that it's going to be feeling scary and dangerous to surrender into the vulnerability of the open heart. That, the, that one can open the heart when the environment feels safe, but if your family members start acting wacky because they're lost in their own grief, then one has to close the heart to protect oneself. And what I'm saying is the stage after being centered is conscious relationship, being in the heart with love, with compassion, with gratitude, with forgiveness. So that there are these stages and Rumi has this quote, grief is the garden of compassion, or maybe more accurately, grief can be the garden of compassion. That's the issue you're dealing with here now. And grief has the quality of separation. Compassion is the quality of being connected. Can you be grounded enough that you have a foundation then for moving into the world in a centered way? that supports then the vulnerability of the heart where you can connect in a loving, compassionate way with not only your family, but with yourself and with your father. Compassion and love are not one directional, omni, I mean, unidirectional events pointed toward your brother or your father, but it's a state of being that includes you, includes everybody. It's, it's an openness that is dependent on being centered in the first place. At the same time, for many people, the death of someone close to you, a parent or a child or a partner, is probably the time in your life when your heart will be more open than at any other time. That all the therapy you can do, all the deep meditations you can do, the heart gets ripped open in a way beyond control by the way that you love and are attached to your father and your family members. Mm -hmm. so, so that can you use this time as a way of learning to inhabit a part of your heart that has only on very seldom occasions been able to be inhabited? That you're plunged into this ripped open heart and when you meet people, you can look at them and you can feel how much they have grieved in their life and how much they have deflected grief in their life. To the extent they have really grieved, they will be able to connect with you. To the extent that they have pushed it away or gotten lost in it, they're going to be protecting themselves from the vulnerability of loving and being loved by you. So that grief arises, we can push it away. Let me get busy. Let me have a drink. Let me turn on Netflix. We can get lost in it. Oh my God, this is terrible. This is... I am the emotion, or we can have conscious grief, which depends on being grounded, being centered, having this embodied mindfulness, supporting the open heart. Thank you very, very much. Extremely helpful. Yeah. And that's a great question that allowed me to say all the good stuff all at once. <laughs> <laughs> so that even beyond that, when you're going, when anybody's going through their lives, if you feel frightened or agitated, you're not grounded enough, right? If you feel guilty or ashamed, you're not centered enough. If you feel disconnected or separate, your heart isn't open enough. If we go back to the beginning of the talk, and I was talking about this more subtle thing of handshaking your emotions, that's not going to be possible until you're able to do what this recent part of the conversation 
has talked about. But what I've been noticing is that I've been doing that and many people have been doing that part for for decades. And there are still these emotions that we see as ourselves that are so ingrained, so much solid, or at least appearing solid, that we're unable to work with them. We just are assuming that that's who we are. What are you feeling right now? What does it feel like in your body? Can you be with it? The feelings, the moving feelings, the moving energy, the emotion, without needing to fix it, without thinking it's a problem, without looking away from it, without hiding from it, turning toward what you're feeling, hearing it as the gateway into being more deeply with yourself. Um, my problem is kind of complex, but I just wanted kind of a um, to know if it's possible to have this conscious grief. I had I was hit by a car in February, and I had brain damage from that. And um, so I was away for two months and came home, and then it was really like um, walking, like being in the day the earth stood still, or one of those 50s movies or something, or everything changed, and I had to adapt to it or <laughs> or not. But I just wonder, because my dog was killed in the accident, I knew it while I was in the hospital, and I tried to somehow prepare myself, but I didn't. <laughs> and um, so I'm grieving for her, but I just wonder if um, I'm able to do this conscious grief that you're talking about. I don't know that how many brain cells are still laying out in the street, but um, I'm trying to put my life back together and it's hard. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so sorry that happened to you. And I'm so sorry about your dog. What was your dog's name? Angela. Okay. Before I was talking about feelings and emotions, subtle and gross. And I've worked with many people at the end of life when often they've been medicated with analgesic medication that interferes with consciousness. Yeah. Uh I have a I have a, a friend who's in, been one of, in one of my groups for about ten years who was hit on her bicycle by a car and has uh, permanent brain damage. She's uh, she's been meditating ever since. What I'm getting at here is that whatever moment is being experienced in life, whether you're sleepy or wide awake, whether you're drunk or sober, whether you have a brain injury or you don't whether you're grieving or not, whether you're happy or sad, that in that moment, consciousness is meeting experience. There's this empty nature to things. Even if your awareness isn't as precise because you have an injury or an illness or an emotional upheaval, what's happening is you're directly meeting experience. And the the process of comparing yourself to who you used to be or what kind of awareness you used to have draws you out of this immediate relationship with experience so that can you accept that your your awareness now that your relationship with the world is different than it was before the accident that it is like a 1950s movie in a certain way just as an example, Ramdas had a stroke 22 years before he died. He had a very serious hemorrhagic stroke. He almost died from it. As you probably all know, that it deeply affected his ability to walk and to speak. For a while, he was angry and upset about this. Why would Maharaji do this to him? Why would God do this to him? And particularly, here's the guy who could speak better than almost anybody on the planet about spiritual things and all of a sudden he can't really talk anymore think about what that must have been like for him but eventually he got to the point where okay 
I can't do this. I can't do that in the same way. I'm really limited. And it allowed him to open and soften and awaken in a way that I think would have been incredibly difficult, if not impossible, for him to do without having that accident, that brain accident, right? Mm -hmm. So that on one hand, it looks like a real problem, like, uh, oh, woe is me, I had a, a stroke. On the other hand, it forced him to surrender and open in a way that he couldn't have otherwise. Now, I'm not saying that God shows you to have a uh, get hit by a car and your dog kills, or that it's a good thing, but here it is. And one of the one of the things they talk about in Buddhism that's kind of counterintuitive, but that one of the first qualities that's really needed is hopelessness. Not hopelessness that things won't be better down the road, but hopelessness that this moment is going to be any different than it is right now. This is the way it is. It's not going to be different. This is the way it is. Can you be with the emotions that come up that are frustrated and sad and angry about what's happened? Can you have compassion for what it feels like for you? Can you ha have compassion for the person that was driving that vehicle? Can you forgive? Can you forgive yourself? Can you forgive the driver? Can you then be then with these gross and subtle feelings of grief and loss and life that are arising moment to moment in the way that we talked about earlier today? It surprised me how much my physical state affects my ability to be present in a certain way, right? If I'm really tired, if I have just one beer, if I am sick or something like that, it deeply affects my ability to have a, a subtle awareness. But there's still the awareness that there is there. Every moment for every human being is open to mindfulness and compassion. It might not be as refined. It might be not as satisfying to the part of you that is goal-oriented, fixing, I've got to be better at this. Not just compassion for how you're feeling, but particularly compassion for that's judging yourself for not dealing with it better. Do you. you want to say, say anything in response to that? Well, that's, that would be something I would like to achieve. I don't know if I'm really trying to do that. I still have a lot of anger. Well, it doesn't have to happen all today. <laughs> okay. But if you're looking at how you feel when you're not doing that, that might be the motivation. What does it feel like to be angry? I mean, that's what mindfulness is about. It's like, I'm not mindfuling this so that it gets better and fixing it. No, it's, it's hopeless. This is the way it is. What does it feel like to be angry that somebody hit me and killed my dog? What does it feel like to have brain damage? What does it feel like to, you know, all, all these things that you're feeling, can you be with that just the way it is? Without the sense of I'm doing it to fix things or to get out of this hellhole that my emotions are at times. Yeah. The, 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 the almost paradox in spiritual life is that the way to freedom from suffering is to feel the suffering, not to try to get away from it. To trust the Dharma, to trust God enough that you can admit how it hurts and love even this moment and this moment. Good luck. I wish you the best. I truly do. How much can we integrate these feelings of spaciousness and compassion and wisdom into activity? Do we really need to get completely lost in activity? What is the most important thing? Okay. Well, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you all soon.
and be well, enjoy the summer. Sean didn't want me to talk about AI, so I didn't. Thank you, Rondo. <laughs> Great compassion, ability, uh, uh, an ability to be with our feelings is going to be increasingly important in these next years to come. Thanks, Ram Dev. Thanks, everybody. Ram Ram, take Much care. Much love. <laughs>